my favorite subject, human or human, I think we could argue that there may be insufficient stability in most of them and we're unlikely to achieve union. And I, I give myself chest pain if I hear the rationale used in conjunction with human fracture and oddly one still does. Even the rock male may have insufficient stability. Periprosthetic fractures may be uh, insufficient capacity for bone healing. So why might the fracture not heal? The bone fractures we discussed. High velocity injuries, segmental fractures. The two fractures above and below and following the first point are a grenade fragment removes part of the bone. There's a fractures which might not heal. And if we create a bone defect by the initial device removing the central segment of the um, or, or the tibia, we can be confident that we have a potential non-union. In addition, uh, we may consider that production stabilization, stiffness in adjacent joints, infection and bone defects. These are the issues we must consider in the assessment of non-union. Uh, while we're considering infection, I would ask you to focus on the issue of Craigie's negative static progress. This is a uh, this lady had a central concurrent fracture, which was stabilised with the nail as you see it. It failed to unite, and this fixation was then exchanged for that fixation which is a proximal ferrule locking nail, an extremely stable device, but the fracture is not uniting and there are loosened zones around the proximal. That is, was caused by Coagulase limited scan, and when you're thinking of infection in fractures, I urge you to consider it. Uh, vascular and Vascularity is clearly the only of course potential for non-union. This particular patient I was relieved to hear, he had uh, opted for amputation rather than reconstruction. He had a non-union, he said, think about it, and it was a huge relief that he decided not to seek reconstruction. Uh, nutritional status, obesity, alcohol abuse, but systemic disease is a huge difficulty for us and possibly for our work. Diabetes, metastatic disease, we touched on steroid treatment and transplant patients. This um, belongs to a lady who has had a renal and pancreas transplant and was on extensive immunosuppressants. And if I can draw your attention particularly to the problem of tacrolimus. Tacrolimus has a, a significant adverse effect on fracture healing, and a patient being on tacrolimus should be able to anticipate a problem. Smoking, we know that, and increasing evidence that anti inflammatory drug use interferes with fracture healing. So we avoid it with our remaining clinic as much as we possibly can. The diagnosis inevitably, we are looking for the history, for clinical signs, or pain, emotion, fracture, and serial x-rays, but serial x-rays for us are much less use than other indicators. And I'd just like to conclude the, this very brief session on the assessment of fracture of union by mentioning the traditional classification. I'm sure you've come across signs like this, elephant's foot, or hypertrophic, or vital non-union, or atrophic, atrophic. This isn't a useful classification, in really. What it's referring to is it's, ref it's an oblique or indirect reference to mechanical instability or biological insufficiency. It's not a classification system that we find useful ourselves. So I would suggest that we just put a little cross through that and think more about what might be causing these extra appearances. Mm. Thanks very much. Right, some of what Graham has just told you. Um, we now really
rather fellow co-founders of non-mediums in different ways. And you've been using the terms hypertrophic, entrophic, or oligotrophic. And as Graham has just said, we really find this particularly unhelpful because it doesn't help us assess what's going on and then address it properly. So perhaps nowadays, you might be better to use the terms mechanical non-union, biological non-union, or a mixture of the two. Now there may be a lot of reasons that something fails to heal. Um, the mechanics, very simply, you've either got too much movement or too little movement. And you can address that. Every picture, as they say, tells a story. There may be too much distance between the fragments. The poor little osteocyte can't jump across a big gap, and you might have to reduce that distance. There may be lots of biological reasons. And these can be really broken down into three factors. Factors that affect the patient that you can have very little influence over. So a patient, for reasons that your door control has a poor blood supply to that area. As Graham alluded to, there may be something wrong with the immunology of that patient. They're immunosuppressed either for disease processes they have or the treatment of those disease processes. And as we alluded to earlier in one of the case discussions, the physical size and shape of the patient may make that fracture more likely not to heal. There are factors uh, that the injury has that, again, you have no influence over. So the energy that's gone into the fracture, the higher the energy that's going, the more likely it is not to heal. Whether it's an open or closed injury, the open injuries are more likely to be contaminated and more infected, and so are more likely to fail. And in a polytraumatized patient, that patient has lots of other injuries, they're going to have problems of uh, immune response, of nutrition, they're more likely to fail. But you can have an influence over the environment. And we've talked about the uh, infection. So if you do things properly, if you deprive that open wound in a timely and proper fashion, you're more likely to get a good result. Now Graham has just alluded to it, and we're going to make ourselves very unpopular with about five or six stands out there, but there is no doubt that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like diclofenac are bad news for fracture healing. If you go back to Amanda's talk at the beginning, if you think about how a fracture normally heals without us interfering, it's an inflammatory response. If you give a drug that damps down that inflammatory response, you're going to run into trouble. The COX-2 inhibitors are even worse. So the basic tenet is that you want to address what is going wrong, either the biology or the mechanics or both. Now, just quickly to recap one of the other talks this morning, we've all started to get these implants on our shelves, these wonderful looking plates that have the ability to do everything. And they've been called blocking plates, but actually it's a plate that allows you to do everything. You can put in unicortical cell drilling screws, you can put in bicortical locking screws, you can put in standard screws. So is a locking compression plate actually a misnomer? Really, this is a general purpose plate. You've got a tool that can do a lot of things. And you need to think about how you're going to apply that. So the name of the plate does not relate to its function. You can use that in any way you like. And you need to think about the way you want to use it. We've talked about this this morning. If you want to use it for relative stability to get cameras, we're going to break. You can use it to get absolute stability in compression as a protection plate for a loud screw, as a buttress plate in a classical immaterial plateau, or for a tension band. But in each occasion, you must think carefully about the, uh, the method you choose and you must apply it correctly using the principles. Now we'll go back, everyone hates classification, but actually if you understand this basic tenet of this classification of diaphysis, then you will start to understand what the mode of healing you want is. Type A fractures are simple fractures. Right? When you reduce the fracture, the two bits come together. Type B, think B equals butterfly. B, that butter, that bit in the middle is known as a butterfly fragment. So when you reduce it, there is some cortical contact on this side, but maybe not on the other. And C, maybe just think of C equals common music. Right? If you think of that, then it's easy. Type A fractures, Y, absolute stability. 
Type C fractures like relative stability. And you can do anything for the bees. You've got to be careful with them. And if you remember that, you won't go far wrong. There are some fractures that we know have a propensity for non-union. This fracture, the distal third of the humerus, is a fracture that has a high instance of non-union because of the movement, and it needs stability. And nowadays, we can do something about that. There are implants that you can improvise to get, uh, to get stability. And this is a distal radius locking plate that I've used on a distal clavicle. Works very well, great stability, patient can get going. Most clavicle fractures, we know, probably heal without intervention. But there's more and more evidence the Canadian Orthopedic Trauma Group with, with McKee and Shellitz have shown very good reasons why some fractures should be fixed. But again, you must apply the pr principles properly. So here's a chap who's had his clavicle fracture fixed, and as I said, every picture tells a story. Here we have lots of callus. So the biology is probably right, the mechanics are wrong. There's too much movement here, you've just got to stabilize it. You should always have at the back of your mind, as Graham said, infection. So when we go in and we do something about this, we take specimens to make sure it's not infected. But this just needs stability. Right? Better stability applied. This is a general purpose plate, a locking compression plate, where, where, sorry, where we have used a standard screw to get compression here and then lock screws in a stronger plate. And that went on to here. Yeah. Now, every picture tells a story. 53-year-old lady, high energy motor uh, accident, that she's ejected from her car, she has an open femoral fracture, open tibial fracture, and this was an open uh, uh, humeral fracture with an elbow dislocation. Right. And this had, as you can see, you can see the little holes on it, it had a stunning external fixator put on it, and it got infected. So the infection was cleared. Now we've got her three months down the line, and this is the appearance. And you can see that there is no callus here. So there's, the biology is wrong. Right? You've got to do something about the biology. But you've also got a fracture that could potentially have quite a bit of movement here. So the mechanics are wrong too. And you need to address both in this instance and keep infection in the back of your mind. And to address both in this instance, we address the mechanics by getting absolute stability, good old fashioned plate, really compression across that. And to address the biology, I have bone grafted it. Right. Taking specimens to make sure there was no infection as well. And unfortunately, she was clear. And lo and behold, a few months later, it goes on to heal uneventfully. You've addressed the, the problem. Here's a young man who uh, decided to overtake a stationary uh, set of traffic on his motorcycle. And he overtook them, the traffic at 75 miles an hour. And the traffic was stationary because there was a tractor coming out of a farm that had a slurry scoop on the back. And a slurry scoop is a big forked thing that takes cow dung out and moves it around. And he impaled himself on the slurry scoop, which went straight through him. I took out his pelvis, bilateral open femur fractures, bilateral open tibia fractures, brachial plexus injury on one side. And he survived. He lost one leg, and he's got an above amputation on one side. And there is our friend on the tibia below this for two years. And now he's three years down the line, he's been in the hospital for two years, and he got so institutionalized he married one of our nurses. <laughs> and now here he is, he uses this leg to transfer, but it's painful. And he's had a retrograde nail put in here, and you can see this is only It's three years down the line. There's lots of callus, but this is not supplying the mechanical stability he needs. He needs stability here. Now you've got a problem here because not only is it mechanically unstable, but you've got a very capacious canal. So just reading him up and putting an in a, a, a nail, it's going to be difficult. His canal measured 18 millimeters in diameter. I haven't got a 20 millimeter nail on my shelf. So he needs stability. And the way to do that is to get a good compression plate in our face. Didn't need bone grafting. This just needs stability. So, compression plate, land screw, the workhorse of absolute stability, and he goes on to heal. 
Now there's a little device that is in your, your set, it's very old, uh, very rarely used nowadays. But this thing, the compression device, is extremely helpful in cases like this because you can use it to get extra compression, to dial in, to uh, get more compression of the fracture. And don't forget its use. No compression on me. This was a, a nice lady who I was at medical school with. She's a doctor and she got kicked by a horse. And she had a fracture of the horse and left a nice hoof point in front of her tibial tubercle. And this was an open injury originally. And the surgeon decided to stabilize this with a, with a ring frame. And I don't have too much trouble with that. That was an entirely reasonable thing to do. However, he was somewhat brave because these wires go immediately OP. And how they went, they went straight through the back of my leg. How he missed the rear mast of the bundle, I have no idea. <laughs> the issue is lying on the stand line. She's walking around on it, she's pain free, but you can see there's a more meaning here. So what is it? Biology or mechanics? It's both, absolutely. There's no chaos. You would expect this high energy fraction to fire off chaos. And uh, if there was deadly chaos, you'd expect them uh, to be an uh, uh, issue with the mechanics. We have a lot of mechanics right here, so you need to address it. So you take the external fixator off, put it in the cast to let all the pin sites settle down, and here's what it looks like in the cast. And um, you probably would like a bit more information, so we've got a CT scan of that. And when you get a CT, actually what looks to be a pretty horrible fracture becomes relatively straightforward. It's actually a fairly straightforward, simple fracture pattern. A type A fracture. Type A fractures like absolute stability. So we put this for absolute stability. But you must remember this, this crucial balance of getting the balance right between stability and plenty. And you must put the down biology. A fracture is a soft tissue injury that happens to have a broken bone. So you must preserve that, that envelope, otherwise you'll compromise your heat. What about the rule of bone grafting? Well, there is no doubt that bone grafting does help in the cases of biological failure. And you will have seen lots in the literature recently about bone morphogenic proteins, OP1, OP7, they're all being touted around. There is actually no evidence that any of them are better than standard iron crest bone grafting in non union work. They give less morbidity because you're not taking them from the, from, uh, the iron crest, but there's no evidence that they're better. If you're going to use bone grafting, it's probably better in cases of C-type fractures, okay? uh, mainly in B-types. Now, some of you might be familiar with the technique, and it's well worth reading about that's uh, popularized by a chap called Thierry Judo from Paris, called Judo decortication, where the approach to the fracture involves taking a very sharp osteotome and taking an osteoperiosteal flap off the fracture. So you take off the blood supply off the fracture, fix your fracture, and then flap that back over the top. And he has an enormous series of these where no bone grafting is done. So here's our lady. This is what we started with. We know from the CT it's actually a fairly straightforward type A fracture. It needs um, absolute stability. And that's what was done. And we were done with judo decortication. So I take the sharp osteotome and elevated the osteoperiosteal flap on this side, put a plate on with absolute stability, and then put the osteoperiosteal flap back over the top. No brain grafting done, she heals. For you. Here's, here's a bit of a challenge. 48 year old chap, very heavy smoker and drinker. His great love is playing squash. And he does this injury playing squash. It's a closed injury and he has this. Right? High or low energy? High. Right? A, B, or C? C. Right. C type fracture. Very slow. So we're going to wait. We wait for the time to go out for this all to get done. And at day 12, this was done. Right? This is a minimally invasive plating technique. The fracture site was not disturbed. Now there are some criticisms of this, and this is one of my own cases, and this is in my learning curve. And I probably should have taken that plate up a bit higher and not put screws in this bit. Because I'm trying to get absolute stability. And what happens? Six months later, he looks like this. Has it healed? 
Well, no, it hasn't. You've got this line here. Right? Well, what has happened? You've turned a nasty type C fracture into a type A. Right? Here's the CT scan of that simple fracture line. Right? So what do we do now? Absolute stability. But all this needs doesn't need to take him down, doesn't need a bird graph, you just need to address the problem. The problem is mechanics sticking a light screw. That's all it needs. Okay. Here's a chap who comes off his motorbike. Very sensible, very educated man. Uh, he comes off his motorbike and wraps his foot around the lamppost on the roundabout. Isolated injury. High or low energy? High. Right. So the transverse type fracture, but there's mostly fragmentation here. High energy injury. This is closed. And on my one, this was done. Now, there's a lot of debate about this, and we'll bring up some cases later that will illustrate this, but perhaps a spanning external fixator might be better. I've got a talk later that will tell you all about that. Two weeks later, that was done. Right? Another hospital, then refer to me. What do you think? Good or bad? Bang. Not, not terribly good because it's It's not reduced. Right, so predictably, that happens. Right, now you've got a problem. Now this chap has got a real problem that you've got to think about. Okay. So what is the answer? In the, the middle union, the real answer is get it right the first time. Apply those basic principles well. If you have a non you look at the extras because every picture tells a story. And if you look at it, you can decide is it a biological problem or a mechanical problem or both. And if you can address uh, the issue, then we will get healed. And as we will get a bang on about over and over and over again, don't forget the soft tissues. Thank you.
force lines. You can see a number of hydro fractures where people fall off the horse and they're then being rolled by the horse. Yeah. Okay. Now what we need uh, more and more forms of um, pelvic trauma. You see in terms of occasional penetrating injuries, openings, and obviously in the uh, fears of war. We're going to talk about bleeding, and bleeding is the real, the real killer of these fractures. We're going to talk a little about the acute management and the recent changes and what we feel may happen in the future. The vast majority of these injuries are closed. We have to remember that open pair of fractures do occur. And they're not always immediately visible. Often the communication the outside is through the rectum or the vagina. These facts have a very high mortality and even higher risks in which it is. We can often tell the mechanism from the history, but also from the x ray features. They usually divide into lateral compression, anterior posterior compression, versatile shear, and those combined fractures. If you look at the lateral compression, that's the sort of fracture we tend to see in the low traffic accident which I showed in one of the earlier slides. These fractures sometimes result in massive bleeding, but the most, most common ones we know. So if you do have massive bleeding, high grade bleeding in these patients, you also have a lateral line that the bleeding may be coming from another source, such as the abdomen, chest, or, or limbs. Yeah, we do the factors. We significantly. The vertical shear factors, again, meaning is a major problem. We have to remember that in some cities, up to 50% of these have a neurological injury. So the pain is conscious, it's quite important to assess that very well. And then the combined factors of the whole obviously have the, uh, the, the worst of all these, the worst of all these factors. I said to me, bleeding is the main problem of pelvic fractures, and that's what kills people. Approximately 90% of the bleeding is bleeding. Anybody who's done, who may hit the bone, will know that sometimes you can really nice to have and there'll be a huge amount of bleeding from the bone source. So obviously, the fractures, the fractured bones do make some difference. We also have arterial bleeding. Now, this is the most of what I mean by bleeding. This is kind of quite constructive. So here we have 20 million of the actual one. And here we have a lot. Now, a lot of value is even estimated to to drop there with about 20 million of blood over one minute. Now it's not very exciting. It's hard to wake you up from your post lunchtime summer. In fact, it's painful to stay. But actually, if you think of that, that's 20, 20 miles of blood over a minute. It equates to 1.2 meters in an hour. And it often takes these patients an hour or more to reach hospital. It equates to 2.4 meters over two hours. So you can see you're very quickly going into big problems from what is in effect was very minor bleeding. And often the pelvic fracture bleeding will be much greater than this. So how long have you done? About 40 seconds. Okay, so that shows you that it's, 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 it's worrying about you know, bleeding is a level like this that cause big problems. So as we can see, all our um, attention must be to address the bleeding as early as possible. Now, at the time of the end, the patient was stripped away. They had a normal blood temperature. They had normal levels of plates. They had normal levels of closet factors. So what was the blood doing with the blood vessel? Well, it was to clot. So if you have a blood environment, it will clot. 
that's become the stress of the major tour, the importance of the bottom, and the fact that the first bloke got that bottom is probably the best bloke got. After that, the patient's becoming cooler, the patient's losing platelets, the patient's losing contact, so your first spot that bottom is the best spot to have. And we need to protect that first spot. The question is how do we do that? Well, I'd like to thank Professor Ryan and Dr. Martin for learning these slides. We think that testing is a real thing. It's now a very bad thing. So here's the baby. She saw off the horse, the horse was rolling in there, and then the horse just got out of there and walked off. Then she's rolling in there, making more power of the tractor, and a nice block for her. What happens? The ambulance is called, the ambulance driver examines the patient and tests the stability. Nobody ever tests the stability like this. They always go, so everybody seems to do it twice. We've all done that and we'll do it. The patient arrives in hospital. The camera is able to see the patient and Examine the bubbles again. So that clock, which was trying to form, has now been disturbed with multiplication. Of course, the calculator is quite excited about this and shows his friend, hey, look at this. Again, <laughs> So this clock is really spreading on the wire. And then the wall comes down and does the same thing. And you're entering into a worse situation. <coughs> so, what we have is that we shouldn't uh, test the impellers for stability. We should do an x ray to clear the impellers. In the same way as for years we cleared the survival spine, we don't have anybody with a neck injury and go, <laughs> we just don't do that. And we should do this, we shouldn't run the impellers. It's very good to reassess for plain coverage x ray. You look better than the test Mr. Burton. Now, so this box had a higher time so far. But it's unfortunately going to get worse now. As far as the HMS protocol is concerned, the pressure should then be low Here we go, low blood. Elastic compression pressure is being compressed again. Significant displacement of the fracture fragments, bleeding from the bare ends. And then the lumbar spine is palpated, the back inspector. Now, particularly in the case of blood trauma, I put it to you that we only find much useful information with the lumbar at this stage. It's obviously slightly different with penetrating trauma. With blood trauma, there's really nothing to be gained from the low blood this stage. And we always talk, we only talk about protecting the spine, so we can protect the spine, and the low blood will be performed later once the nose has been cleared. If the patient's rolled back again, the clock's again disturbed, and the third bleeding occurs. So we protect the clock by not testing the humility and not going away with the patient. You can also upset the job, the best thing to do is to try and you know, increase the pressure on the blood vessel. So if you resuscitate the patient rapidly with fluids or iron coats, the blood pressure rises massive, massively and the clot is blown off before the bleeding occurs. So we're now advocating what we call permissive hypotension. So it's us taking the patient to a level where there is a palpable radial pulse. And we don't fit that usually close to approximately uh, a systolic level of 90 to 100 milligrams per liter of mercury. We will protect the pelvis while we're finishing off the uh, resuscitation, secondary survey, and before definitive care. 
Now, the real number is how to find the boundaries on the market. But equally well, you can use a sheet of the patient's trousers, you will tie them across the front of the pelvis at the level of the grocery counters, and it can be secured with a tailor tie or with a knot. The tailor tie is a really for temporary stabilisation, it can be left in place for up to two days. There are concerns that they increase the displacement in natural compression fractures, but actually they're not going to displace the fracture further than occurred at the time of the initial injury. And what we're learning is that we're keeping the fracture fragments relatively still. If left on for too long or too tight, then skin necrosis can occur. So these patients are dying fast without intervention. They should be assessed by a trauma team. Go through the normal ATS protocol of A, B, C with protection of survival of spine and pelvis without emission level. You assess the urethra, a PR and a PV should be performed, and if conscious, the neurology should be assessed. I'm going to repeat it again, a plain x ray to the pelvis. Whether the person is required, you've already tamponized the pelvis with a binder, you check the top, and these patients also still need blood. Now, there is a reason for the line of the crystal area early on, but actually, it might be a place to use blood tests to replace the blood for the blood. Now, certainly, we are often in the past. If we've had a patient with massive bleeding, we start to get blood, there's always a good delay. And then after a while, we realize that ultimately we want some FFB, some platelets, etc. The human organs are never particularly rapid, never were particularly rapid, and they require lots of therapies and lots of delay. So, what we're in the process of introducing into our hospital now is what's called a massive transfusion protocol. So, rather than the medical therapy, there is one therapy to the other being told. It will automatically then know that we require three units of blood immediately, and then the second pack of blood, blood products, comes automatically, unless told to stand down with the second phone call. And in the second pack, for every, for every uh, um, bag of red cells, comes fresh red plasma, flavors, and we may introduce some possible factors as well. So the new phones have been introduced, so it's been significantly less delayed in resuscitating the patients with blood and blood products. Our aim is to prevent the lethal trial of carbon monoxide, acidosis, and hypothermia. And we'll tell more of that a bit later. So, what do we do with our respondents? Well, the majority of all respondents are those medals. We know that we need to consider angina and embolization. That will work with our three little things. That also requires a bit of expertise. And uh, in our hospital, we can, um, we can perform an antidote mobilization approximately five days after seven. So it's good luck when we come in. And then for those of us that are still not responding, we need to go down the line of packing, which I have to confess having no personal experience of. So what's the role of this sort of fixation? <coughs> We're well, arguing to be no longer trying to fix external fixations in the research department. We've moved towards a, a, a bottom. But so the bottom can only be used for one to two days. And if you anticipate a delay in definitive fixation or in transfer, and then a, a, an anterior external fixator, if the fracture is appropriate, it's still needed. It's not a huge year of the assessment. For examination, we look for blood up in the atus. We look for massive strain of the parallel strength, and high level of phosphate. If there are any of these, then we will generate the pass of the catheter. However, if there is blood up in the atus, high level of phosphate, then we go for the epidurologist who will form a urethra gland. And if there is any other problem with that, then the blood is full. We shouldn't be able to the patients until the balance is clear. The 
which led to the massive transfusion protocols. It's a good idea, and, and certainly not just for thyroid fractures, but for any condition where there's massive bleeding. And certainly it's actually improved our relationship with our hematologists who are not feel involved in these complex cases rather than irritated by them. So in conclusion, the first block of your thyroid fracture is your best block and it should be protected. Thank you.